Okay, welcome to this week's installment of Inventive Problem Solving and Biomedical Engineering. This week's lecture is going to involve invention through analogies, and that's going to include something called biotrees, which you may suspect is biology combined with trees. If I can reiterate one of the concepts from the last lecture that every new invention builds upon existing inventions and technologies and conditions, Isaac Newton, in fact, said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So every invention builds on the shoulders of its predecessors. And I believe that we all invent via analogies. I mean, where do our ideas come from? They come from our built-up experiences, some pre-existing ideas, other inventions that we've seen, that we've tucked away in some recess of our imagination. And if this were not true, then why would patent 799999, for example, not have been invented sooner if not for the fact that certain things had to happen and ideas needed to be accumulated and collected so as to give rise to this. So as we're trying to consciously become more creative, we have to ask, where do your ideas come from? Well, some people are gifted and they have ideas what appear to be by accident divine intervention, bolt of lightning, whatever you call it, they, you may uh, collectively refer to it as inspiration. You also remember the statement by uh, Thomas Edison about invention being 99% perspiration by conscious effort. But nevertheless, even with a, a prescriptive method like trees, at the end of the day, it forces you to come up with your own idea. It doesn't give you the idea, it gives you some approximate idea from maybe a same problem, same general area, or something in a completely different area that's analogous enough that you can see the similarities. Maybe technologies that are analogous. There's also biological analogies that stimulate a lot of creativity. And then I personally like to riffle through the patent literature, the scientific literature, to look for ideas and inspiration. But most of all, we rely on our collected life experience. I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that trees is based on the same idea. Remember, it contains a set of inventive principles that were derived from a collection of pre-solved problems or patents. Then when you use the Innovation Workbench software to find an appropriate principle for the problem you're solving, it leads you back to those very pre-solved problems and it gives you some examples. And where do you go from there? Well, the answer, of course, is that you need to make a leap by way of an analogy. The hope is that you'll see some similar pattern in that example that reflects your problem and thereby inspires you to discover or invent an analogous solution. Within art and architecture, it's commonly known that nature and biology and anthropometric proportions have inspired artists throughout the course of and even modern architecture including Frank Lloyd Wright who is most notable for saying that form follows function and fitting his architectural creations into their environment and on the right you can see another obvious case of a biologically inspired um, Biological analogies not only impart and inspire aesthetic features, but also functional and structural features. Classic case is the scallop shell, in which an otherwise flat and flexible material becomes stiff because of the undulating conformation um, of the shell, which we see in cardboard, we've seen in uh, corrugated roofing, corrugated tubing, a corrugated fencing, but by far the scallop is much more delicious. You may have also noticed this structure elsewhere, like in uh, corrugated tubing. Some analogies are relatively obvious, like using the idea of a suit of armor from an armadillo to a uh, knight in shining armor. And then some analogies require a little bit more insight or creativity or inventiveness such as recognizing the principle by which muscles attach themselves to rocks could be translated in some way 
to a surgical adhesive. Not surprisingly, there is, in fact, a whole branch of science and theory of design dedicated to the study of how to capitalize upon designs from nature. They go by the name biomimetics, sometimes biomimicry, also bio-inspired design. And there are numerous books and some laboratories and centers throughout the world that uh, dedicate themselves to this field of study. There is, in fact, something known as BioTrees that attempts to explicitly embed examples from nature into the tree's framework. So unlike ship hulls and nuclear reactors and that type of thing that we find in Innovation Workbench, BioTrees attempts to implant biological examples to make it less of a leap of uh, imagination and also to harness biological examples to solve man-made problems. So just by way of example, separation in space, we know well the Band-Aid illustration. Uh, an equally creative biological example is human teeth. The contradiction being that the teeth need to be sharp for cutting and yet flat for mashing. So the solution is separation in space. You have cutting teeth at the front of the mouth where you need to do the cutting, the incisors, and yet having your uh, molars at the back of your mouth to do the mashing. And this is but one of many, many examples. And I wish that Innovation Workbench contained such examples. It's one of my fantasies one day is to find the time to populate uh, Innovation Workbench with biological examples. And who knows, maybe one of you in your future career will find the time to do this. It would be a huge benefit to uh, students for years to come. Truly, the abundance of inventive problem solving you find throughout nature is amazing. And it goes without saying that we can learn a lot from studying the ingenuity that pervades all of creation. I'd like to share with you just a few more examples that I found on the internet. This one is from Andres Harris, who's kind of a designer, artist, architect. He wrote an article, The Biomimetic 1.0, which explains how he looked at the paradoxically lightweight yet ultra-strong structure of bone found in the skulls of birds to inspire his design for a biomimetically optimized surface. So obviously bird skulls need to be hard, but need to be very, very light, hence a contradiction. And it's solved by this trabecularized type of structure that's mostly full of air, but is just masterfully configured so as to provide the strength exactly where it's needed. So Andres used this in designing certain shells and domes and the like for various architectural structures. And then there's our very own Robotics Institute that's well known for inventing snake robots, which really isn't an intuitive type of robot. But when you look at it and you see the diversity of articulations and, and uh, functions it can perform, it actually makes a lot of sense. And it's a perfect example of an invention that could benefit from or has benefited from uh, a page out of the book of nature. You may remember in a previous class with the Children Institute there was a young child with difficulty proprioception uh, detecting the environment around her and we had conceptualized some uh, various designs to give her some feedback of her environment and it may have occurred to someone that bats have a similar problem. You've heard the expression blind as a bat. We know that bats fly at night and they really can't see very well. And you may also remember, maybe from biology class, that bats kind of see by using ultrasound, by using echoes. And sure enough, everything that's old is new and new is old. Some inventive problem solver came along and invented a cane for blind people, it calls it the ultra cane that uses that exact same principle. And when you look at it, it's really brilliant. But on the other hand, it's kind of obvious now that you see the answer and you draw the analogy. 
some clever inventions of nature are literally under our noses. Sorry about the pun, it just slipped out. When you think about your teeth, however, they're as strong as glass, they're very brittle, but yet they withstand a lifetime of chomping of all kinds of hard foods. I mean, how do they do that? Well, researchers at a Tel Aviv University actually examined the ultrastructure of teeth and discovered that there is a composition of microcracks that allow the teeth to actually heal over time. Now, it, they're trying to replicate that structure into synthetic materials that could actually heal over the course of time, which really would be an amazing breakthrough, and I wish them best of success. Here's an invention of nature of a similar vein, a perpetually sharp tool. Let's see if you can see the inventive principle. I'm not going to read this to you. I'll let you read it yourself. Okay, time is up. What is the inventive principle? The answer is number 34, rejecting and regenerating parts. Shark skin, another well-known structure of nature that has inspired a number of inventions. You may have heard of shark scale inspired swimsuits that have a type of scale that makes them particularly smooth. Well, there is a group at the Fraunhofer Institute that's trying to translate that same structure into a type of paint so as to make any number of man-made devices such as wind turbines and ship hulls and airplanes uh, more aerodynamic. And you can also kind of see the underlying principle of separation in space. Here's one last engineering example known as BioWave. They've actually been around for a long time and they struggled for quite a while but I think they're now starting to get some traction, actually make money. I'm not going to read this um, caption for you. I'll just uh, let you read it for yourself. But it's another obvious example of using uh, a natural principle to harness the energy of the tides so as to produce power for the grid. If you've ever been to SeaWorld or the Science Center or the Cousteau Institute or just watched Discovery Channel, I'm sure you have marveled at the extraordinary diversity of sea life. Just when you think you've seen everything, there comes along another more incredible, more exotic, amazing creature that you would never have invented in your wildest imagination. And I think this illustrates the endless potential for us to learn from nature. And again, remember that we can see the same inventive operators that we learned in trees in these inventions of nature. Can you spot the inventive operator here? The answer is hybridization, also known as local quality. Inventive principle number three. Another somewhat obvious and classic example is um, added to printing, which is now being recognized as the future or the dawn or the, the next industrial revolution. But when you think about it, this is what bees have been doing for millennia. And if you double click on that upper left hand um, uh, image, you can see a short video that just illustrates a cross section or quick overview of this um, new so-called revolution. And here's a short two minute video that's just absolutely amazing that shows high speed video of uh, a colony of bees creating their beehive. And the lower right hand corner is something that you'll just never believe you need to see it. And then speaking of honeycombs, it's yet another structure that uh, we have employed gainfully in um, engineering both uh, structural members and heat conducting members and um, and other um, engineers. 
I'd like to return once again briefly to the field of industrial design because it's become part of their standard operating procedure to derive inspiration and ideas from nature. We as engineers don't have this as part of our curriculum and some of us even consider it cheating by copying from nature. But I think we can learn a lot from the industrial designers and perhaps it's time that we accept a little bit of humility and let nature offer us some hints for solving our engineering problems. As I said, there are numerous books. I happen to like this one book, Cats, Paws, and Catapults. It's now in its second edition. Stephen Vogel has a number of books, uh, Vital Circuits, Life's Devices being uh, two of them that I recommend. And then there's some new books I have not read that have just come out in the past couple of years. So if this is a topic that interests you, there is an awful lot of to be inspired. There are even uh, centers and laboratories, as I said, for biologically inspired design. I perceive that it's an area that's actually growing in interest, and I think we're... And just one last tidbit, this website of Ashok Gol, an investigator from Georgia Tech, he's developed a software program called DANE, it stands for Design by Analogy to Nature Engine, for which he given uh, an interesting TED talk. It's kind of long, so you may not want to watch it right now, but you might want to tuck that away for future reference. And in it, he uses something like our function means diagram, a combination of it and the contradiction diagram, to extract functions for which there are biological analogies, which in turn would inspire some uh, creative invention. So it's not too dissimilar from trees, but instead of using a repository of patents, it uses a repository of biological solutions. and fun. So in summary, our ideas must come from somewhere. And most likely, it's from an accumulated life experience, both within our discipline, from what we learned in school, from within engineering, and also outside the discipline, from our hobbies, our relationships, our life experiences. So invention occurs not only by deduction, but by induction. And one of the take home messages is then to cram your head full of examples of inventive problem solving as much as you can possibly hold just to soak it up and to maintain an appetite for studying the works of other inventive problem solvers. Or as an alternative, we use systems like trees that codify the collection of inventive principles which you can then apply to your new problem. But as, as I said, we still need some kind of inspiration, some kind of analogy to actually uh, manifest a solution to our problem. And just by the way, this also illustrates one of the values of that knowledge base within Innovative Workbench. I realize it's not the best software in the world, but there is a lot of hard work and, uh, and value actually packed in there if you're willing to dig into it. I'd like to close on this one final thought on biological analogies. Having now studied biology for 30 some odd years, mechanical, electrical, biomedical engineering for 25 years, attempting to be an inventor and to solve inventive problems, I never cease to be humbled and awe-inspired by the wealth of invention throughout nature. The Eagle Nebula is something that just really drives this home for me and it really blows my mind. It was a structure discovered in 1995 by the Hubble Telescope. It's a 5.5 million year old cloud of molecular hydrogen gas and dust from which stars are born. It's approximately 70 light years by 55 light years in size which means that it takes 70 years for light to get from the bottom to the top of that column. So juxtapose whatever magnitude of, of invention that man has created, that you've created, to something of, of this enormity, and it just puts everything in perspective of how diminutive um, our inventive abilities are. And just by further juxtaposition, this is a diatom that is only 2 to 200 microns in size. 
and you can look at just the marvelous uh, sculpture and microstructure the mechanical properties the functional properties of something that's really not more than just um, an algae and there are approximately 100,000 versions of diatoms in the ocean and in the earth and it just really is humbling and um, and just uh, it puts everything in perspective so that's why I always have said and I, I have as my tagline of my email that when it comes to engineering God is my hero okay thank you everyone for your attention the homework should now be available on blackboard whoops looks like I made a little mistake I never said I was perfect and I look forward to seeing you all on Thursday. I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun.